Hello everybody, this is Dr. Bachbeck coming at you, and we are going to um, try to finish the agricultural section in this video. Um, if I didn't already, oh here, good, I thought I might have closed that tab where I had all the videos going on for you. All right, um, so I hope everybody's staying safe. And uh, remember, your homebook assignments are up there. You can do them as your leisure, but uh, just pay attention to all the uh, uh, due dates on them. If you have any questions about them, send me an email. Um, but the next one, I think, is this Friday um, for the uh, podcast. Or maybe it was this Friday. So the next one will be a, another podcast for you about renewable energy because I'm going to try to get into the uh, – fossil fuel section uh, right after this agricultural section. So let's get to this agricultural section uh, real quick and uh, get it over with here. Uh, but this is some good stuff here in the ending part because we're going to talk about uh, sustainable agriculture to start off with and then uh, get back into some of the industrial agriculture, how we use it and uh, what's been happening. And remember we talked about all those pesticides and uh, stuff that we used on in, in the industrial movement to the green revolution all right and yes they in, increased the yields uh, because it killed off all the pests all right but we've had some problems um, resulting from that remember we talked about earlier in the semester about uh, the punctuated equilibrium theory where it wasn't um, evolution didn't uh, go by uh, like Darwin said, is nice, smooth, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of transformation. There were also some sudden jumps in the evolutionary chain that went really quick, all things considered. All right. And scientists think that's because there was some environmental change that caused one mutation to really adapt. And we saw that little thing about the, the eyeless shrimp. Um, and how that happened in the Gulf because the shrimp born without any eyes um, were easily uh, able to live in that environmental conditions. Uh, but one of my favorite punctuated equilibrium um, examples of right in front of our faces is what we have been doing with um, this, these pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. Um, we have created our own punctuated equilibrium because we have sprayed these things on uh, areas of land for so long that there was a certain mutation in the plant or the pest that allowed them to resist um, the pesticide or the herbicide. I mean, potato bugs are resistant to DDT, and that's pretty freaking hard to do. But a mutation happened with inside the potato bug that allowed them to eat DDT all they wanted, and hey, they're good to go, right? This example right here is about pigweed, which is a, uh, a weed. And farmers, you know, love to spray the ready roundup out there and kill off all the all the weeds and the corn and the cotton would just grow because this is what's called a genetically modified uh, crop. And we'll talk about that a little bit today, what that really means. But it was resistant to the, the, the cotton would grow and everything else would die. And that's basically how they designed it. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, Mother Nature did its thing and mutated. And one strain was stronger and fit in to that new environment, suddenly a new environment, and was able to thrive. So let's let's check this uh, little uh we video battle. Out. Okay. Underway down south. This is harvest time for some very valuable crops, cotton among them. And this year, farmers have a real battle on their hands. A menacing weed that seems to have a mind of its own. Steve Osami has the story from Marvell, Arkansas. Yeah, we call them super weeds or super bugs. That's kind of like the acronym for them. It's called the pig weed. Native to North America, and for decades, farmers have been able to control it by spraying their fields with herbicides. This past summer, Pace Hinesley and other farmers started noticing the chemicals were no longer working. There's no rhyme or reason how we can control it. The weeds have adapted, and this year they're choking more than a million acres of cotton and soybeans. 
it, it can, can be, be very, very, very expensive. In, in the last three months, months Jim Hubbard, Hubbard has spent more than, than half a million dollars fighting, fighting them, and, and they, they still, still won't die. die. So, so man, man versus, versus weed today, today who's, who's winning, winning this round? Weed. weed. This, this is one formidable... Yeah, I don't know if we could beat Mother Nature. Look at that thing. Holy cow. Say he spent billions and millions of dollars on these big combines. And... and Boom, gone. Agriculture for 30 plus years. I've never seen anything that can have this kind of impact on our agriculture. This plant here could produce how many plants next year? Oh, uh, two million cows? Farmers are already attacked, hiring laborers to walk through their crops and chop the plants down before they start. Back to manual labor. Sometimes their tools break. Oh, look at that one. Yeah, I blame the farmers. That's it. It was only a matter of time. They just sprayed too much of it and quickened that speed. We already knew we were we were beat. It's unbelievable. <laughs> we already knew Mother Nature was going to change it. <laughs> back to back to organic farming. You know, back to the way we used to do it because of Mother Nature. You know, you know these farmers spent all this money on the equipment, and you know it's good stuff. But now there's pigweeds coming up, and we're back to back to the manual labor again. It's crazy. And that is the punctuated equilibrium um, that we created, um, and it just shows the power of Mother Nature. And just like this virus is it's floating around, it can change on a dime. Um, just through a little mutation inside of us. But we've been, you know, battling this, uh, doing this kind of, this is, what, is an example of what's called genetically modified organisms. All right. And this is a little bit, that's a little bit different because we're actually taking genes. Um, we took a gene and um, changed that cotton plant. So it was resistant to those herbicides. All right. Well, we're doing other things, too. We've been, you know, separating the black sheep and the white sheep so we can keep the two different kinds of cotton for a long, long time. And this is one of my favorite examples of us doing what's called selective breeding, all right? And this is different than genetically modified organisms because we take that, we see a, um, a mutation in a bird, in, in a chicken in this example, that uh, makes it advantageous. So there was this one chicken that has what we call a greedy gene. It just eats and eats and eats and puts on weight. Just like that one guy you heard in the podcast that grew. I mean, he just started, kept on growing and growing and growing. Well, these chickens have a gene that keeps them packing on the pounds. All right. And we saw that and we picked that one chicken out. And that's the chicken we actually sell in the marketplace because it gets more bang for our buck. Makes sense, okay? And we bred them to be as efficient as possible and selected that gene and made a new, basically a new breed of a chicken called the greedy gene chicken, right? But, you know, those chickens uh, use a lot of energy um, and they get overheated in tropical areas. And there's just another gene, it's called the scaleless uh, gene, uh, where the chickens don't grow any better. So we're trying to... Uh, I figure out how to blend the two and you know, watch this little video. And this is different. Remember, this is, a, you know, us manipulating man going in there and changing the genes. Mother Nature had a mutation. We're taking advantage of that mutation because um, we can feed more people or make it more economical or whatever. So we've selectively bred them to have greedy genes. genes. A chicken like this will put on Let's have this get back up for now. Breeding greedy chickens has a side effects. As, as Olivia is about, about to discover in our chicken shed. These chickens may look normal, but they've been, been bred to grow as fat and as fast as possible. Greedy chickens have heart rates as high as 300 beats a minute. They have a high metabolism and find it difficult to cool down. In charge, in charge of solving the problem of overheated chickens is geneticist Dr. Abigdor Kahan. As long as they are kept in cool environments, this is not a problem at all because this heat is dissipated 
to the legs, to the face, and that's sufficient. However, once this for the progeny of these birds are already in the tropics and hot conditions, because the gradient in temperature between the body temperature and the ambient is so small, they can hardly dissipate the heat. So it's just like the tropics where you put That's right. And I just can't get cool. That's right. Since I'm a geneticist, I was looking for a genetic solution. That means instead of cooling the environment of, the, of chickens with feathers, is helping them feel cool by just removing the feathers. So I decided to go to the extreme situation of developing boilers without feathers at all. Can we have a look? Sure. Let's go. Chickens without the gene to make feathers. I'm fascinated to see what they look like. Yeah, and, and here, here they, they are, the featherless chickens. chickens. They, they look, look like miniature dinosaurs. What we have here is that the original, original mutant. mutant. This, this is, is a female. female. She's amazing. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. <laughs> this, this is the male. So and as, as you, you can, can see, see, no scales on the feet. Right. That's why the mutation is called scaleless. They've done that before, but they're only as little as the miniature dinosaurs. Yeah. The sexually mature males become red with the interaction between the sex hormone and the light, which creates this red image. So it's testosterone plus light change red. That's right. These are adult birds. This is mature body size. They will never be bigger than this. When I started, I started to cross birds like this one, with the ones that we saw, well, they, they try, try to slap. <laughs> they still know how to slap. Right. Having successfully bred small feathers, small feathers chickens, Dr. Dr. Kahana wanted, wanted to see if he could Check this thing out. It's huge. That was the challenge, and indeed we managed to do it, as you can see here. <laughs> this is an environment. So that's what, what a chicken looks like that you eat without the feathers on it. That's like the size of it. But look how big that is compared to the other one. Dinosaurs, we should call them. These chickens are the result of Dr. Kahana's selective breeding program. And after six generations of mating the chickens with the featherless genes, this is what we've ended up with. I can imagine most people's reactions at seeing these chickens is one of revulsion. But if you were a chicken in a 100 degree heat, you wouldn't want feathers, believe me. And anyway, they're not the first animal bred to have their natural covering removed. Look at pigs. Wild boar are furry. And even we humans were once apes, entirely covered in hair. So perhaps they're not as weird as they first seem. What is the future of these chickens? Are we going to see them in the supermarkets soon? Well, not in the supermarkets in the UK, but hopefully in the supermarkets in the tropical countries, in Nigeria, in Indonesia, where it's very hot. So this farm is easier and more efficient because there is no need to plant them. The proportion of meat on this bird is higher. So the chickens in the tropics, they grow faster than a bird with feathers because they don't they don't get held off by the fact they get too hot. They're healthier, they're costless, because you don't have expensive housing. Sounds fantastic. Good for the person, good for the bird. And that makes sense. Um, you know, I'm not uh, adverse to either genetically modified or, um, you know, this hybridization kind of stuff we do. Um, it's... You know, they both had their advantages. It's going to be up to you to decide whether or not you like them or not. Okay? Um, we can see that that breeding that chicken is definitely, they seem healthy chickens. They don't seem, you know, I can't talk to them, but they seem kind of nice. As long as you treat them nice, I'm, I'm okay with that. And, you know, we have this pigweed problem, but we were able to produce the, cor the cotton a lot easier for a couple, you know, you know, a hundred or a couple, like 50 years. So, um, what are we going to do about it? And my solution is just go back to the way it used to be into what's called sustainable agriculture. And there's a bunch of different names for it. Uh, but working with land. 
And uh, I am, you know, I, you know, that I like the post growth carbon institute, uh, um, car, the car, post carbon institute, and they, you know, also talk about how we're gonna have to change our agricultural ways because most of our agriculture is based on energy consumption, right? And one of my favorite case studies of how we are going to have to change is how Cuba did it, right? And you know, I'm kind of on the you, know, you guys know me, I'm a Bernie Sanders man, and I believe that uh, education is important and literature and learning how to read is important. And Cuba did a good job, he says, um, about that. And so does Barack Obama, and so, so does the world, okay? Um, but what also happened to Cuba during that time is um, they became, believe it or not, one of the most sustainable nations in the world because of what they went through. And that was because no one would trade with them. They started way back when with um, you know, the Soviet Union and communism, and they were, that was the main trade uh, partner, and they were able to keep them afloat. And then the Soviet Union collapsed, and they were basically stuck this island in the middle of the <laughs> – not in the middle of the ocean, but out in the ocean all by itself and had to quickly feed its own people and do all these different things. <coughs> Excuse me. And – it was just amazing what they had to go through. And, and, and when I look at their system of sustainable uh, agriculture today, I kind of think about how the world is going to have to kind of move to this kind of way of thinking as well. And it's a good case study. It's not perfect. They didn't do things perfect, of course. All right. But I think we can actually learn, right, uh, from how they did it. So let's watch this little video about uh, the, what's called um, – how Cuban agriculture went from industrial to sustainable. And yes, I don't like the, you know, the human rights that Cuba does, but they did this part very good. Their people are actually able to be fed. And their coral reefs rock. Oh my goodness, they rock. When we look towards the industrialized and chemically heavy agriculture, it's hard not, not to notice, notice the massive, massive yields that are pulled from the soil every day. And it's, it's equally hard to imagine a system that could possibly replace such a large operation. operation. Although, Although local food systems lead to stronger and more sustainable connections to food and community, is it really possible for a mosaic of small food markets or systems to support a country like the United States? To answer that question, let's dive into an agricultural model that has been largely isolated from global trade patterns, chemical inputs, and fossil fuels for over four decades. Cuba. Cuba is truly a unique case in agriculture because it's existed outside of the global system for so long. Up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba mainly grew sugar and traded exclusively with the Soviets for staples such as rice, wheat, tractors, and gas. But the system was dramatically upended in 1991 when the Soviet Union unraveled and the U.S. maintained its trade embargo on Cuba. The country was left isolated from oil, staple foods, and mechanized farming systems like tractors that were a cornerstone of their farms. As a result, Cuba entered what was deemed the special period. Journalist and author Bill McKibben writes that in 1989, the average Cuban was eating about 3,000 calories per day. By 1992, however, that number plummeted to 1,900 calories per day. In short, Cuba was starving because their semi-industrialized agricultural system was ripped out from under them. They no longer had access to the machines or chemicals that allowed them to produce and trade sugar on a large and global scale. So, so they, they turned, turned inland, reanalyzing agriculture not as a global endeavor, but as a national and local pursuit. In essence, Cubans, out of necessity, transformed their food system into a network of thousands of small rural farms and urban market gardens that used organic principles to heal rather than destroy their landscape. Here's where it gets interesting. This rapid transition from a fossil fuel dependent and monoculture based system to a diversified food culture is a key lesson to take away from Cuba's special period. McKibben shares that in the 1980s, Cuba had more tractors per hectare than California, 
but by, by the 2000s, tractors were quickly replaced by over 400,000 oxen teams. Monocultures were implanted into polyculture. Crop diversity was valued for its ability to decrease pest pressure and encourage healthy soil. So only using, instead of using pesticides, they switched things up and made polycultures and brought in the good stuff. I love me the urban farm idea. I want an urban farm on every corner instead of McDonald's. Maybe we can still have McDonald's just next door. And the gas station that's closed. A small parcel of land, but one that produces food for 80,000 residents in the surrounding community. But Havana and Cuba in general still need to import certain foods. Especially in times when the island was devastated by hurricanes like in 2008, when it imported nearly 55% of its total food consumption with meat and vegetable oils among the highest imports in the country. So Cuba's local food system isn't perfect, but it shines in comparison to small-scale food systems in countries like the United States, where most urban and suburban dwellers are hard-pressed to find a local vegetable vendor close to them, but could walk a mile in either direction and likely find a handful of fast food restaurants. What then can regional food systems in a place like the United States Learn from Cuba's transition to organically focused agriculture. Cuba's taste is... And now she talks about regional, okay? Taking consideration the biome of that area and what they can grow. Right? Not a national. we got to look at it regional. The, the macro is only as good as the micro. Cuba's government encouraged and supported national universities that matriculated hundreds of thousands of bright minds. Education. Specializing just like Abe Rankin did when he did the Morell Act and created all the um, universities in America. Seriously, it was all about growing food and teaching agriculture and farming for free. It demonstrates that a successful, sustainable agricultural model should function within and for local communities. Local communities. Diversity equals resilience. The macro is only as good as the micro. But it shows the power of small, diverse, and intensive farms. When applied to the United States, this means leaning into endeavors like backyard farms and community-supported agriculture. Just two practices among many that help build local food systems. The ultimate goal of this is to develop strong relationships between community, farmers, and the food we put in our mouths. Yeah, so I really like that, uh, you know, I... <laughs> As much as I don't like how they treat the people in Cuba and some of the rights they don't have, they really made this transition because they needed to feed their people. Um, so this kind of gives me hope. And I think that we should try to not mimic, but, you know, take the uh, positive out of how they did it and start applying it to um, our way of thinking in agriculture. Okay, If we don't, it is going to uh, be too late, in my um, humble opinion. Okay, so we really need to uh, get on it, right? So, um, so sustainable agriculture, and that's what we really, I think, we need to switch to. Okay, and there's a number of approaches that have been uh, implemented uh, in sustainable agriculture, and you can call them all different kinds of things, right? Um, but some of the keys to ag to uh, sustainable agriculture is one thing is called crop rotation. So this is the process where the farmer alternates the crops um, every year. So one year they might have uh, corn in this little area over here, and then the next time they might put beans in. 
because right? these two plants actually work together. The corn needs nitrogen, and the beans put the nitrogen back into the soil, and then the next year the corn is planted there, and they have uh, get that nitrogen. Okay. Uh, water has uh, been one of the most erosive things when it comes to losing soil. All right. Um, so now we're trying to crop a little bit more uh, advantageously to stop that runner, uh, water runoff, all right? And, you know, the uh, machinery that we have now helps us do that, all right? So the water has, uh, so each furrow runs perpendicular to the hillside so it doesn't you know, run off. It will catch some different things, all right? Um, and also we use what's called terracing. So this would be um, the furrows and this would be the terracing down here. So we do all these different kinds of things just to help manage the soil because we know that if we take care of the soil, we're going to have a, a good, healthy crop, right? We also do what's called intercropping. I like this idea, all right? And this is not new for uh, any, any society, okay? The Indians actually did this. They called it the Three Sisters. They would plant the beans and the corn together instead of separately. So the beans... Um, grab that nitrogen from the air. That's what they actually do. We know that from science, but, the, you know, they just saw that the beans and corn work good together, all right? Um, and it puts that nitrogen in there, and then the corn grows up. Plus, if you think about it, you plant the corn, um, and then if you're using a pole bean, the corn uses the, the bean, uses the corn to grow up and uses that for its support. Um, so you get your own little fence or terrace for our pole beans, if you guys ever grown for pole beans before all right, and it's called a three sisters because they used to, used to uh, put squash or pumpkins in between the rows, and they would weave the uh, squash or a pumpkin grows on a long vine, so they would weave that in between the rows of corn, and the leaves would keep the soil nice and moist and dry, and if, you know evaporation wouldn't happen as much. Um, so it was like the three different sisters. All right, and each one would would um, also you know um, mature at different times. The beans would mature first, then the corn, and then the squash. So they get three different harvested harvests out of the same area of land. It's simple, right? I wish you guys could see my face right now. <laughs> it's just simple, it makes sense, right? Um, so that's what kind of uh, you know when I studied sustainable agriculture up at. Um, WVU, we would do those calculations. How much more yield would you get from planting the corn, the beans, and the squash together? And then you take those three things to the market, you make more money than just planting a whole um, acre of corn. And many a times, many a times, there's very few times where the inner cropping wouldn't make the, the um, farmer more money. Okay? Plus, we have what's also called cover crops, which are used to reduce the erosion, all right? So as soon as something is uh, harvested, um, something planted right behind it to keep the soil in place. And it's usually something um, like a leg loom, like a, a bean that will help restore the soil, all right? And then when you're ready to plant for the next season, you, you turn that down and you've got some organic matter in there. So there's always some life happening on that soil, all right? There's always something growing. All right, grabbing stuff out of the air, putting it in the soil, keeping that soil nice and healthy. All right, we also have what's called our shelter beds, which are rows of trees or shrubs that serve as a windbreak. All right, um, and these trees can also be habitat for birds or something like that, or fruit trees or something like that. You can see them down here in this little picture. All right, um, and also, believe it or not, it's also from pest management because sometimes the moths don't see it and they don't go over and start planting their eggs in the zucchini plants, all right? Yeah, all right? So not only for, you know, help with the wind and uh, you get an extra intercropping kind of thing, all right? Sometimes these are called uh, hedgerows, not shelter beds, but hedgerows. There's a lot of different terminology, but it's all basically the same, okay? Um, we also do what's called conservation tilling, which reduces the amount of plowing. Um, that is neat, and this is what I used to use. Um, I had to still uh, do some tilling, all right, but I would do not, I wouldn't go down that far. And I have this really small little tiller, as a matter of fact, all right, because when we till, it is actually we um, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere, all right. 
Um, and also, there's also no-till farming, which will eliminate selling all together. You need some special equipment for this, all right, where they just totally inject the seed right in there, all right? And they kind of do some disking beforehand, but uh, disking is a little bit different. It's kind of pounds up the kind of messes some stuff up, but it's not the same as tiller. All right, and they put it directly in there, and then it grows with inside the grass. All right, but it depends on what uh, crop you're actually growing, because some some crops will do go good with no till. All right, but we're trying more and more. All right, and that's one of the people when I was um out at that uh, seminar. That the guys talked about that no to, that we talked about the worms and bringing the soil back to life. They do all no till too um, when they uh, were doing their experiments. Okay. So the most important thing of how we're going to change our agricultural society or agricultural ways is how policy is going to be determined by the policy that we promote um, in the United States government. All right. The policy can promote conservation measures for in the agriculture. And believe it or not, most of the industrial agricultural um, areas get the most money out there. All right. Uh, for all the money. Um, many nations spend billions to subsidize and promote unsustainable practices, such as growing watery, thirsty crops in desert regions. All right. And these subs subsidies help stabilize and secure low income farmers. But they also lead to the land uh, being cultivated that otherwise would not be uh, cultivated. So if it left to its own uh, fruition, we wouldn't put uh, those almond trees in California. Though it has the right temperature, it does not have the right precipitation, all right? But we have the technology to put that, excuse me, put that um, irrigation in there to keep the trees alive, all right? And that irrigation is subsidized, all right? So this artificially uh, increases uh, food production and lowers price uh, for the other farmers, and it just becomes tougher and tougher for them to survive. Okay, so that's why one of the reasons why the small family farm is kind of disappearing. All right, the big ag gets a lot of the subsidies, drives down prices, and the man owning the or the farmer. Okay, and women can be a farmer too. All right, we need more women farmers. So. Come see me if you want to be a woman farmer. Um, I'll help you. Um, lowering it lowers the prices for the milk, all right. And a lot of the small milk farmers are going out of business um, because of that reason. And it was way before these tariffs came in. Okay. So every five to six years, the U.S. Congress passes a legislation called the Farm Bill, which guides the agricultural process uh, policy. All right, so it's renewed every policy that we review here in the United States is renewed every couple of years, and then we uh, say yes or no. All right, this is where your food stamps come from, this is where your uh, subsidies to the farmers come from, and things like that. The Conservation Reserve Program, uh, first established in uh, 1985, and that's called the, it was the Farm Bill, and it pays farmers to convert damaged croplands to conservation reserves. All right, this is kind of uh, the same principle that we were talking about with the uh, pheasant way back when. The, the rough, I mean, not the pheasant, but the rough grouse. Okay, uh, here in Pennsylvania, we pay those farmers not to cut the grass. So some of the farmers, we, we said, hey, farmers, we're going to give you a little bit of extra money here um, to help uh, turn some of this damaged cropland back to normal. All right, uh, make it another wetland or what have you. And that will be how you're going to fart, all right, just by restoring some of these, okay? And it's worked out pretty good. Uh, now, controlling pests and preserving uh, pollinators are very important. You know, no farmer wants their crops to totally die because of a pest, all right? And a pest is any organism that happens a crop or a livestock, all right? So a bug that gets into your uh, chickens and you get the chickens get sick, that is also considered a pest. Um, a weed is any plant that uh, competes with the crop, all right? And my favorite saying is Eeyore saying, a weed is still a flower once you get to know them, all right? So a weed is something that you don't want in there. And we know that it's, you know, survival of the fittest, and there's going to be competition for that nutrients. And when you have more things working together, they don't... Uh, hit their maximum yield, 
right? But believe it or not, what we're looking for with the intercropping is actually having those plants work together and help out. So we know that beans, when planted together with corn, you get a better yield because those two plants work in symbiosis. Remember that symbiosis part? They work together, all right? So the key is to try to find those plants that work together and plant them in there. Uh, many people say basil and tomatoes not only taste good, but they also work together. All right? And then if you throw a couple marigolds in there, it keeps away uh, the pests from eating your tomato plants. Yeah, unbelievable. All right? And the way we the way we farm today in the industrial monocultures limits the ability of these natural enemies to control the pets and popul uh, populations, causing the farmers to turn to these chemical suppressions. Well, I don't know if it caused them to do that. It, it's it was the way it was designed, right? We heard in that video that uh, the people blamed the farmers for 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 it, right? But they knew it was going to happen. All right, so we need to come back into the natural symbiosis and create an ecosystem for our farms, not trying to overpower uh, Mother Nature, in my humble opinion. All right, I think that's how we're going to maximize our yields and feed an ever-growing population. Because when we get up to 10 billion, 13 billion people, we're going to have to start really uh, reorganizing the way we grow food no matter what. All right? So pesticide use includes synthetic chemicals that kill the insects, all right, um, and nearly 4 million kilograms of ingredients from pesticides are applied to the United States each year. And they get on the plants, and guess what? I don't. Some of them we can't really just wash off, all right? It's just the way it is. Uh, pesticides also kill non-targeted organisms. It's discriminatively, it's discriminatory killing. So what the pesticide does, it 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 uh, not just goes over uh, and tries to kill the locusts. All right, it tries. It, it's designed to kill all hard-bodied animal or insects. All right, so not only the locusts, but the praying mantis will die. Okay, and praying mantis are a predator in your garden, and they're always welcome in my garden, all right? But if I put some of that pesticides to kill what they were supposed to kill, then it kills them both. Make sense? So we got, you know, that's another one of those things we need to understand, that it's discriminative. And same with the herbicides. So, you know, yes, that cotton was able to survive, but that's because it was genetically modified. All other plants died. It didn't kill who. I mean, it didn't matter who you were until you got that mutation. The pig mutation was the one that was able to, to survive. Okay. So chemical pesticides tend to become less effective over time, as we saw in that one video. All right. It, they're just not working because we have what's called, you know, mutations in the world that are able to punctuate the equilibrium. Okay. And we're creating our own one out there and i'm getting i am you now personally concerned that uh we have overshot and we may have lost some other things but we can come back we can stop doing that all right um individuals with uh with the gene will survive and reproductive so just you know just common knowledge all right even the people that designed the herbicide realized that it was going to happen sooner or later it just happened faster than they thought Okay, uh, most obvious alternatives to chemical pesticides is biological control or biocontrol, where the natural predators or parasites are introduced to eliminate the pests. All right, sometimes people will go out and just put uh, uh, ladybugs out in their gardens because they are good for eating uh, aphids. Okay, um, but we also uh, do that biological control by what's called genetically modified organism. So we have taken what's called this uh, BT, all right, this bacteria in the soil, and we have introduced that gene into the corn. All right? So when that worm starts eating the corn, they're eating that BT, all right, and it kills off the worm. And that's a natural... Um, natural uh, organism that's inside the soil, 
okay? Um, well, now, whether or not you agree with putting a bacteria inside of the corn itself is up to you. Um, some people have some ethical concerns about that, uh, but that is just a natural part of the ecosystem, and it's already getting into us, all right, and generally considered safe levels, right? Biocontrol organisms have, uh, in some cases, become invasive and harmed non-targeted organisms. So the cactus moth is a natural predator employed in Australia uh, to fight prickly bear, pear, cactus, uh, which is also used in the Caribbean countries, but has spread to the United States and is now consuming our native cacti, right? Uh, one of my favorite uh, biological control organisms that's what Australia did is they uh, actually brought in the um, frog this frog oh my gosh remember those um, videos of the catfish or the not the catfish but the cart flying out and uh, uh, mice used to see the frog problem they have in Australia too uh, the best way to do it though you know is a balance between you know not only using pesticides and herbicides um, but uh, biological controls and stuff like that. So what we try to do uh, is called integrative pest management, which combines biological controls, chemical controls, all these things. And we look at the ecosystem where we decide what needs to be done. Sometimes we might have to blast it, all right, and, you know, start over um, because it's just too bad because um, it's totally infested um, from an invasive species or something like that, all right. Most of the time, that's not necessary, right? Uh, but we try to uh, design something that fits into that ecosystem where we're not using as much chemicals as we need to, as, as before, right? It's just smart, um, smart management. And this has been highly effective in, in uh, Indonesia and in some other uh, areas around the world, and here in the United States, okay? Uh, pollination is the process of which plants... Uh, pollinating each other. I think we all know that, all right? But today, the pollinating insects are dwindling in numbers. We already learned about the insect, insect apocalypse that's happening out there in the world, um, and we need to be aware of that. Uh, but it's also happening to the pollinators. Um, colony collapse disorder is a phenomenon where uh, most of the worker bees of the hive just disappear. Um, they're not found dead outside the hive uh, from a parasite or something. They just never come back. All right, and restoring these bee populations is, is um, getting important. And there's a good experiment that's going on. We kind of trace some of the, well, we think, okay, it's not proven, um, but we think that some of the bees were uh, being affected. Remember that those pesticides are non-discriminatory, and one of the pesticides that we were spraying on our crops was killing off the bees. Um, so we, what... Europe did is ban that pesticide, right? In the United States, we're still using it. So we got a nice little experiment going on across the pond, right? One area of land without that pesticide and one area of land with that pesticide. And guess what? It seems that the bees in Europe are starting to bounce back and there's less um, colony collapse disorder. <coughs> this is still, you know, the data is still not in. This is still looking like, um, you know, we have to find out what's going on, of course. Um, but we will, we will see, all right, and hopefully um, it will make a difference, okay? So raising animals uh, for our food, today we can see that uh, the uh, consumption of meat production has grown uh, fivefold uh, since the 1950s. The wealthier uh, nations become, the more meat they will eat. It's just kind of like an economic fact. Because we got uh, more money, so we uh, go for the higher grades of uh, foods. Okay. Um, now, having said that, it's kind of a cultural thing as well. All right. India, you see them uh, now making more money, right? Starting to uh, build a middle class in that country and stuff. But they're still not eating meat. Uh, reason being that uh, their culture does not eat cows, right? So it all depends on the culture as well. But we always see that the consumption of meat typically goes up as economies grow. Okay? 
So every time one of the organisms consumes another, only about 10% of that energy actually moves to the next trophic level. Right? Remember, we learned that before. The body, you know, the plants have the most energy, and then as you go up the food chain, you have a little bit less energy when you, we consume them. All right? uh, so feeding grain to a cow and eating beef from a cow results in the loss of the most grain energy in the cow uh, metabolism. So most of the energy in the primary producers or in the plants is consumed by that uh, cow and not passed on to us. Okay, so eating a little more in the food chain, of course, uh, is more energy efficient. Okay, and will reduce your ecological footprint. And I have to, you know, do my disclosure. I have trouble doing the meatless Mondays, um, even though I try my best, of course, to try to do that. Okay, and then you can just see the diagram. Uh, it takes a lot more feed to get this cow. Okay. So the way we do this is sometimes we use what's called a feedlot. And they have benefits, but they also have costs. So a feedlot is where huge pins are designed to provide high energy feed to animals living in high densities. All right. So they're also called um, confined animal feeding operations or factory farms where we pack as many uh, cows and chickens and pigs into one single area. And feedlots have benefited from being more economically efficient uh, and have reduced our grazing impacts, okay? But it comes along with um, some problems, all right? Because feedlots also have produced more intensive pollution uh, due to um, all the fecal matter and bugs and pests and stuff that inside that area, all right? So first, we've got the pollution of the of all the fecal matter and it's high in nitrogen and phosphorus and you know it, it contributes to um, the algae blooms out there in some of the uh, ponds and waterways that we have all right but there's also all the bacteria population density factors right you bring a lot of animals together those pathogens are going to pass faster and faster throughout the population and it only takes one all right so what we do to do that is we give them these antibiotics, right? Even if they're not sick, and those antibiotics go into the cow or the chicken and get passed on to us, right? Also, we put hormones in there because they're not able to grow uh, naturally. So we uh, juice up the hormones to get more meat on their bones, right? And those hormones are passed on to us. And other uh, drugs administered to the animals um, may also be excreted into that uh, waterways so due to the public uh, plumbing of wild fish population we're starting to do what's called agriculture doing some more intensive uh, farming with fish you know basically putting in the fish tanks all right and agriculture has increased the food supply uh, for protein source of fish and uh, food security so it has its pluses and its minuses all right because we had those fisheries collapses uh, we need to produce more fish, uh, but the same kind of antibiotic problems and uh, fecal matter waste problems are happening and you know, spread of disease and stuff like that are happening in the uh, agricultural industry, um, not aquaculture industry as well. All right. And we've had our first genetically modified animal uh, that became approved for human consumption of um, wild salmon. Right, some of this wild salmon actually got loose into the uh, open oceans. All right, and you can actually tell the difference between the wild salmon and the uh, uh, natural salmon or the genetically modified salmon. All right, uh, they actually have to inject more pink into the meat to make it look like a normal salmon. All right, it's craziness. Okay, but uh, it still, I guess, tastes good. I'm not a salmon eater, so I wouldn't know. All right. And those are genetically modified organisms, or genetically engineered organisms. And that refers to a process where scientists directly manipulate the organism. They take DNA out of one organism and put it into another. And it doesn't matter if it's a plant into an animal or an animal in a plant. For instance, there's a, a tomato out there that was out on the market that was um, genetically modified. We took a 
a gene from the flounder, the fish to flounder, and put it into a tomato. Um, because tomatoes uh, don't uh, handle a freeze. So that gene from the flounder was able to keep the uh, frost, I should say, keep the tomato plant alive if it frosted. So we got a couple of extra days of harvesting. And it worked great. We got all these extra tomatoes. Uh, too bad the tomatoes tasted like cardboard and no one wanted to eat them. All right. So we took them off the market. But that's still out there. And that's what genetically modified organisms do. We take a different gene from a different plant and actually put it into that, into that organism. All right. So GMO crops have uh, been adopted and planted all around the world. Um, so we got golden rice, BT corn, uh, virus-resistant papayas, ready Roundup, uh, ready alfalfa, and cotton. I mean, it's all over the place. So G you know, our genetically modified uh, foods have just doubled. So you can see the sale of GMCs have increased in the United States and other countries. So here's the world total of genetically modified and millions of hectares planted. All right, dramatic increase. And they came in 1983. They were actually allowed to be patented, and then they hit the market in the late 90s. All right, and you can see industrialized world um, increase of the uh, GMOs. Um, but we're giving those GMOs to, to the developing world too to help feed them. And whether or not you think GMOs are GMOs are proper or not, that's up to you. All right, but you're definitely eating them. All right, soybeans account for more than half of the genetically uh, modified crops out there in the soy and just about everything we have. All right, so you can see here the United States plants uh, about 40% of the genetically modified organisms, all right, um, and 51% of that is soybeans, all right, corn, 30% of that. Cotton is 13, and then you have the other uh, uh, granola and the others. All right, so we specify most of the genetically modified uh, plants into the same crops that we actually eat all the time the corn and the cotton. Uh, well, we don't eat cotton, we use that for our fibers. Uh, but the soy, the corn, uh, palm oil, all right. So what are the impacts of genetically modified foods? And this is the big discussion out there of what's actually um, happening. Uh, remember, we have what's generally considered safe, and we do the studies. And, you know, eating that tomato that that was genetically modified with the flounder is not really, I mean, the taste might be different. But the tomato itself is actually safe. I mean, I can't, uh, you know, there's no human... Uh, bad thing that's going to be happening to me for eating that tomato per se, all right? Um, and proponents of the GM argue that they can, you know, enhance the food security because it gives us that extra three weeks of uh, tomatoes out there, alleviate the pressures to, since we're getting more of our yield, we don't have to clear the forest, um, it conserves water by, you know, uh, Using the the genetically modified so it doesn't take up so much water, um, improve the nutrition in the crop. So we actually add um, a gene that gets that golden rice more vitamin A, so everybody gets their nutrition. All right, and the reduce of uh, pesticide, um, which I kind of say um, is not true. All right, I think we've actually increased our pesticide use. All right, uh, so you can see, although insecticides uses Ink decreasing herbicide use is growing uh, because many weeds are developing the resistance and right? spurring, spurring farmers to apply even more. Um, but what are the impacts to GMOs? Okay, like I said, just eating that tomato itself, they're you know basically equivalent, right? But ecologically is my very uh, is one of my uh, concerns. The scientists are concerned that the GMOs will interbreed with the wild relatives, transferring new genes to the wild population. All right. Um, for instance, there was a seed out there that didn't get introduced into the ecosystem, but it was um, coined what's called the Terminator seed. And you can do a Google search on it if you want. 
Um, the company called Monsanto decided that they had this genetically modified the tomato so it would not produce any seeds. And man, that would make man our production of um, tomato sauce so much easier. You wouldn't have to get rid of the seeds. I don't know if you guys ever made tomato sauce, but it's tough to get rid of seeds. You got to do this grind and mix and mess all this stuff. All right, so it really would help out, okay? But the industry was hit by a bunch of activists. And could you imagine if that Terminator seed, that gene that stopped the plant from producing seeds, got out into the wild? Wow, would that, I mean, all the plants just stop producing seeds. Could you imagine? All right. Um, they did not put this out into the wild or out into, you know, on the market or anything, grew anything up besides like a lab, I guess. Um, but they still reserve the right to grow. All right. But that's one of my considerations that I uh, have to think about is that uh, the transfer. And this can be seen also with uh, some of the corn growers. So there's a, a guy at the far family farm whose dad has been great, 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 great grandfather from passing down the corn seeds. All right, and one year he goes out and plants them. Monsanto would come by and, and steal an ear of corn, go back and test it, and it shows that it uh, has its genetically trademark in it, its genetic trademark inside those corn seeds. And that guy gets sued, that um, small farmer got sued for stealing the patented seed of Monsanto without paying the royalties. But that was just cross pollinated. He had nothing to do with it, but it still loses in court. Unbelievable. Um, some also feel that we should adopt precaution. So, I, you know, that makes me want to adopt what's called a precautionary principle. Don't introduce those gene out of seeds until you know what is going to happen to the ecology. And if that seed, if that gene can be passed on and all that other stuff. All right. And that's probably my biggest concern. Um, when it comes down to the ecology, Another big part of the public debate is that every person relies on a food for survival and genetically modified rice, corn, soy, wheat, um, essentially forces people to consume a biotech prop, uh, uh, product, and it's basically patented, right? So these companies uh, come back, like I said, and uh, we'll be able to sue the small farmer if their corn is cross-pollinated, um, right? Um, and also there's some ethical things. Um, and this depends on your religion or how you feel of whether or not man should be manipulating individuals, okay? Or uh, its own little crops, right? So the growth of sustainable agriculture. Uh, one approach to sustainable agriculture is organic agriculture. Um, and it was established, these uh, priorities were established in a list of recommendations for organic uh, food production in the 1990s um, it is pretty good standard that uh, most sustainable farmers like to try to practice all right and about 80 percent of americans buy organic food at least occasionally out there um, so there is an increased demand um, but they need to understand who that is all right you need to know your farmer and do your proper research all right so you can see here, this is land and organic pro, um, uh, production in the thousands. So the cropland is actually grown, right? Um, you could be uh, certified to do this, okay? Certified operations, right? But you don't necessarily have to be uh, certified um, to call yourself organic unless you want to sell it on, a, on the grocery store. You need that certification. But the best way, like I said in... Uh, Cuba did it, is to do the locally supported agriculture. Try to find as many uh, small farms, put these small farms and small marketplaces all over the United States. I want a small farm on every corner, right? Uh, and produce these, what's called farmer, uh, farmer's markets, or what I used to have before I got hurt, what's called a community supported agriculture system, a CSA, where commerce, you know, people used to pay me in advance. They would, you know, pay me 500 bucks to reserve a little, you know, grow them their own backyard garden on my land. And then they would come in and get uh, uh, receive a weekly harvest of uh, a garden I basically designed for that. And it worked out pretty good. I wish I could still do it. Um, maybe I'll start that back up again, but I need someone else to run it. I don't have the physical attributes anymore.
But sustainable agriculture must meet in the triple bottom line of social, economic, and environmental dimensions, all right? So we need to be able to make sure we provide that food security. I don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. I want to make sure that we still have enough food for everybody to eat. Um, but it is possible. Um, we can grow enough food organically or sustainably to feed everybody. There's no ends, there's a but the bottom. Uh, but it needs to be profitable for the farmers and ranchers to do. Also, I believe that is possible too. All right, that research out there shows that not only people pay for a premium for organic uh, produce out there in the marketplace, um, but it's actually um, cheaper to, to produce. Don't tell anybody that, all right? Um, in my humble opinion, in the studies that I've seen, that, that the farmers actually are not uh, spending as much money. They do spend more labor and um, more uh, education on it, though, um, of the food crops, okay? So that is it for the agricultural section. I know this one was a little bit longer than uh, normal, um, but I wanted to get that over with. And next we are going to start into the uh, fossil fuel section. All right. So I will get this uh, posted for you and I'll get going on the next one. Thanks.